and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. You made it last day of ISCA. Yay. <laughs> We're here. So my name is Anna Sorrell. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm on the board of ISCA. And you are here for our lightning talks. So we have four presenters. We have some here today and some who couldn't make it. And ones that aren't here, we have their uh, video presentations to share with you. So we're going to learn a lot today. Session is Dr. Puneet Gill and Elizabeth Miller from Texas A&M International University. And that's in Laredo? That's correct. Um, that is in Laredo, Texas. It's so nice to meet everyone. And thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, and Elizabeth and I um, have written a little paper together and we'd like to share uh, the paper. It has to do with climate change and um, nature walks. So Elizabeth will start off this paper and then I will, this little discussion, my, my apologies, and then I will just conclude it. Um, so we'll, we'll start off with Elizabeth here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gill. Hi, everyone. My name is um, Elizabeth Miller. And yes, we are from TAMIU, Texas A&M International. So I'm so excited to be here with everyone today and talk about um, uh, this paper we wrote based off like climate change and this experience, very interesting experience I had with uh, my nephews during this pandemic uh, in the nature walk. I'm just going to share my screen with you um, so I can present to you a PowerPoint. OK, can everyone see my screen? Okay, so hopefully everything works. Please bear with me. So um, before I get into the whole logistics of this entire presentation, I have a question for all of you. Do you remember seeing a butterfly when you were a child? If yes, what color was it? Okay, now I want you to hold on to that memory in your mind. And I want you to imagine a world without butterflies due to the destruction of their habitats and the detrimental impact that would have on their ecosystems. Like Dr. Gill mentioned, um, you know, so many species are being impacted by climate change and so many things that, you know, we are doing to our own planet. So luckily my nephews and I are still able to see butterflies and we're hoping so many future generations will be able to see different species of butterflies. So we got to witness the birth of a butterfly, okay? I'm a 21 year old, I had not seen a butterfly come out of a cocoon. So I was there cheering with my two nephews. They're very little, they're the ages of five and six and children are just so curious and they're natural scientists. They want to explore their world. And you know, we, this, we saw this butterfly and it was a giant swallowtail butterfly. So when the moment came for Mr. Buddy Duck Butterfly to finally spread his wings and fly, we had a problem. He flew straight to the ground. So my nephews and I were very concerned and they wanted to help Mr. Butterfly. Hold on, I still hear the audio. Let me pause it. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, so they, want, they told me, the Elizabeth, what are we gonna do? We need to help this butterfly. And I told him, I'm not a butterfly doctor. I don't know what to do. So this is when our investigation started. Um, um, before beginning our investigation, we carefully picked him up and placed him in a bougainvillean plant that we had seen based off the migration patterns in Laredo. There's in my backyard, this is bougainvillean plant that has pink flowers. And there's always a party there with butterflies. So we decided to place him there. So the next day we saw him there again, and this is when our investigation started. So we started, you know, by identifying the species of butterfly that it was, um, which was a giant swallowtail butterfly. And it's very common for these butterflies to come to Laredo around like the months of October and also the monarch butterflies, which is so beautiful to witness. So we learned from the internet, we learned how to build a terrarium from, you know, basic items we found in our house. We used just a container and we placed a little bougainvillean plant and a little bottle cap of water. And my nephews were like, how are we gonna feed this thing? And I told them, I have no idea. So I actually talked to Dr. Gill and she was like, let's continue to research how we can do this. So we found a glucose substitution like recipe for butterflies. And it's made out of honey and water and you soak it in a paper towel. So um, we discovered a funny fact, by the way, Butterflies eat through their dermal fleas. Their feet, yes, their feet. We thought this was so crazy. My nephews thought it was hilarious. And I, as you can see, I was learning alongside them through this experience. So um, 
my nephews learned so many valuable lessons from this. Another thing that they learned was that, you know, um, the life cycle of a butterfly. So I, as an aunt, I was very concerned. I was like, okay, this butterfly is going to die eventually. How am I going to explain to these small children the survival of the fittest? Eventually, I found the words to tell them, okay, Mr. Butterfly is not as strong as his friends in the sky, so he's not going to survive as long. And when his imminent death came, we were all very sad. My whole family bonded through this experience. And, you know, we were very heartbroken, and the children were too, but they understood. what, Like, they finally understood that, you know, life is so fragile, and we need to protect the organisms and their environment. So through this experience, they got to use their science, math, and reading skills, and they got to research about the migration patterns, but not just that. We had very important discussions about climate change and about how these migration patterns are being impacted by people destroying literally their homes. So another important thing that they learned was the importance of getting to know their environment. Considering the virtual learning platforms that we have now, not many children are in school, at least not in Laredo for you know, for us. Children are not having those authentic experiences to go outside, to get to know their environment, and to really connect with it and have emotional connection with it. So um, as a future teacher, I hope to use these informal science experiences to, you know, talk, like to trigger these conversations we need to have with our, our children and our students about climate change and, you know, really um, valuing our environment and protecting it. So before I, I pass it on to Dr. Gill, I want to leave you with a quote. So this is a quote by David Sobel. And he says that if we want our children to truly flourish, to, to uh, um, truly become empowered, let us allow them to love the earth before we ask them to save it. We can't ask or you know, try to make the next generation of you know, green kids that want to protect their planet if we aren't taking them outside to get to know them. So, I encourage you, if you're an aunt, an uncle, uh, you know, uh, grandparent, mother, whoever you are, if there's children in your home, don't be afraid to take them outside to get to know their environment. And, you know, every time my nephews and I see a butterfly, we think of Mr. Butterfly, which is what they named him, and everything we learned from him. And, you know, just this small experience had so many lessons, and it's a spark that can ignite a fire, like I said, to have these important conversations we need to have with our students. So with that said, I wanna pass it on to Dr. Gill to conclude this presentation. Let me just stop sharing my screen. Okay. I'm still trying to get used to Always these. have to take out a microphone. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much for sharing um, your experience. I really appreciate that. And, that. and I wanted to kind of articulate that this is a part of a larger paper um, where um, I was looking at secondary pedagogy methods and in informal science environments. And I found that there was a lot, there was a lot going on, a lot of inquiry, a lot of online teaching and online um, sharing of inquiry experiences. However, and in the discussions um, that I saw on, online, but also um, in larger literature circles, there was this perception and larger narrative that, the, that climate change was actually being solved by the pandemic because nobody was traveling and there's lower CO2 emissions. So, you know, let's just put this on hold. And my, uh, and I kind of think the opposite, we really need to talk more about climate change and connections to our specific communities because of the pandemic. Um, you know, so we, we were, I, I asked my students to conduct these nature walks and to tell me what they found. And then we wanted to talk a little bit more about the connection to how this relates to habitat fragmentation in the community. And also the fact that, you know, in our specific community, we're the largest inland port. So we see a lot of cars and trucks and vehicles coming through Laredo. And um, there are a lot of issues that, that we have to deal with here, especially with the, um, the migration patterns that we have here and the beautiful um, species that migrate in and through from South America. So this was the challenge I kind of gave to Elizabeth is to think about this butterfly in terms of the larger narrative of climate change and how this affects our specific community. Um, so we learned a lot through our informal discussions. We actually had a couple of informal discussions, which allowed her to understand um, that there were community, there were there were organizations that are paying attention to the migration patterns and to the fragmenting of habitats that's happening because of the expansion of our communities. And so this discussion can also be had with smaller children in terms of you know where does this butterfly come from, where does it go, how does it travel. 
uh, where does it live? And so this is just the larger you know, connection that, uh, that I hope to make in this class. Um, and that's really you know, all I, I wanted to say, but I'd, I'd love to you know, answer questions later. I'm not sure if we're at 11.15, so we may need to go to the next uh, presentation. But, um, but I, I, I'm really happy that we got to share this and thank you so much for, for listening to this presentation. We sh we're a little bit more flexible today. <laughs> so if you have, if anybody has any questions or if you have anything else to share, yeah, we can go like just a couple minutes over time. I love that story about the, I mean, just like those like meaningful, authentic connections are so, so valuable. I, mean, I think probably all of us have experienced something like that with kids, yeah. If anyone has any questions at any time, uh, you can type them in the chat. Um, but if you don't, at this time, we'll get started with our next presenter. It's, uh, Claudia Martinez Gray from the International Museum of Art and Science. Yeah, yeah she's ready. <laughs> All right. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Claudia, um, I'm from the IMAS. We are located in McAllen, Texas, um, which is uh, close to the Mexico border, all the way south. And um, we quickly had to transition, of course, like everyone else, um, to online programming. And our summer camps is our biggest money maker. So I had the task of figuring out how we were going to make money in a pandemic, <laughs> um, which was really fun uh, to do, obviously. No, it was it was a wonderful experience. And so I wanted to share some of the things that I learned along the way, which um, could be considered failures. I like to call them lessons. So these are lessons from virtual summer camp. Um, and I just like this image here because I felt like we were all kind of precariously uh, t like sitting on a, a, a branch and that could break at any time. It just felt like everything was such like in a fragile state. Um, but eventually we, we got over that. Um, so just really quickly, our virtual camp structure. Um, we had Monday through Friday camps, weekly themes, um, which were centered around our mission, which is art, science, and culture. We had a curbside kit kit pickup um, and all of the kits included all the supplies that they needed and 15 independent lessons with step-by-step -step guides. So I had each educator as they wrote their lesson make an actual example of the product or the activity and then they took pictures of each step along the way and then included those in the lessons for the children. Um, and then we also had uh, Zoom webinars in the afternoon, which were about an hour and a half. So we engaged with the kids one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the educators were available for office hours during the day if anyone had, had any issues or um, struggled with any of the lessons. And they were, about, they were targeted for third through sixth graders, but we did end up taking K, seventh. I mean, at, at some point, you know, they're at home with their siblings and everyone wants to participate, so the more the merrier. Um, we capped at about 22 campers. Um, some weeks we had less, some weeks, you know, we were about 18. $40 per camper and we offered a member discount. Um, our camps are usually like $160, so we made them affordable to our eyes. Um, and we also gave um, free lessons that could be done at home um, without having to print anything out with just using basic uh, supplies from home. Um, and what I will say, yeah, cutting off age group is hard. Um, we we did work with people if they wanted to do uh, something with K. Um, we offered a different uh, maybe supply instead of string. We offered like pipe cleaners or something like that, things that they can manipulate easier with their hands. Um, basic supplies were offered if kids did not have it. So the supply kits did not include scissors, glue. I mean, that stuff is really expensive. Um, but uh, most kids have that at home. If they don't, you know, we were um, part of our registration online said if you whatever you need, markers, uh, sharpeners you tell us we'll provide it. Um, so we did it that way instead of giving it to everybody. Um, and we always had two educators on the webinars, which is just like the biggest thing I could, if anyone does anything virtually, just have two people. <laughs> um, so lesson one, don't be afraid to ask. We asked everybody for free stuff. Ask caregivers um, what they're looking for. I emailed one of our camp parents who we um, have every year, year after year, and I was like, what do your kids wanna do? Because we've done everything to the moon and back. Um, and so having them tell us exactly what they're expecting was fantastic. 
Um, we asked for pizza boxes from Domino's. We asked for paper bags from HEB, um, which we use to package our kits. They can also serve if you cut them up as tabletop covers for painting or anything like that. And then also as trash bags or the kits can turn them into costumes. Um, we asked our auditors <laughs> for pencils and they gave us pencils. I mean, we were just asking for supplies from anybody. Um, restaurants too, uh, we got like a free kid meal coupons and things that we, we included. Um, lesson two, you got to use what you got. Um, fossils are always trendy. Kids always want to learn about fossils and things. We have tons of rocks in our fossils in our collection. Um, so while, you know, we want to do Minecraft and Lego camp, um, we just had to really stick to what we knew best. We didn't have time to explore new topics. Uh, separate packs of supplies. Supplies are really expensive and the supply chain was completely broken. And uh, so it was really hard to get things. So um, instead of giving them a pack of metallic markers for a project, we gave each kid like one marker or like a group of pastel colors instead of a whole pack of pastels. And they just kind of, we challenged them to just work with what we had. Um, we brought our ambassador animals on board um, for little shows. Um, we did Zoom tours of our gallery spaces um, and we did this with mobile. I don't recommend walking around a gallery with your laptops. <laughs> um, we just used what was out there. I mean, Google Maps, we did tours of people's houses, you know, like historical figures' houses. Um, wildlife cams are great, especially for zoos and aquariums. And then we just brought up any YouTube channel video that was like relevant to what we were talking about. Um, we did a lot of like step-by-step -step drawings and things like that. Um, quality over quantity, this is something you have to fight for. Uh, so we, I set really clear expectations from the get-go with, with the team. I wish I had incorporated the entire team marketing, um, you know, finances, because I think the expectation was we were going to take as many kids as possible. No, no, no. <laughs> it's really best to have a small group and, and, and make really strong connections with those kids and have them engage with each other. Um, it was also important to reiterate to have purpose, um, to have learning goals, to stick to your mission. Um, we didn't need fancy tech. We didn't, you know, we used our webcam uh, uh, on our tap on our laptops. Um, some people use their phones to zoom in. And um, yeah, we didn't. We, I did live streams. Here is a picture of me during the live stream. I did a live unpacking so the parents could or the caregivers could have an idea of what the kid included that week. And just consider saying no. At some point, we just had to turn people away, and we felt really bad about that. But I. I went in one Saturday to pack kits. And after I did that, I was like, I'm not doing that again. I, I, you know, you have to just say no. You can't be exhausted and then also show up for the kids that same day or the next week. Um, lesson four, involve others. People on your staff, they have hidden talents. Um, so just ask them like, hey, what do you wanna do? Do you have any cool ideas? Let me hear them. We had um, one girl, uh, she, she's, a, she's a fantastic artist. And so she sketched uh, coloring pages of all of our ambassador animals. And we included those as special treats for the kids. Um, we did Friday show and tells so the kids could show us what they made uh, throughout the week and also whatever they wanted to show us in their room um, when they're home. They love showing uh, their pets and, and everything that they collect. Um, I love hearing from all the kids. So, you know, there's always those one or two talkers. Uh, so I love saying, let's hear from someone who hasn't shared um, and just prompting them to, to be more open. We had a lot of struggle with, with shy kids and um, it took a lot of practice to get them involved. Um, so just stick with it. Um, have guests, have people come and visit and pop in. It kind of breaks up that time. An hour and a half is a really long time to sit on a computer. So we did active activities, we did charades, um, we, did, uh, we did all kinds of things like um, that got them up and moving. Uh, so yeah. I encourage you to just bring other people on, even if, it's, even if it's like your curator, just come in for five minutes and talk about something. Lesson five, a growth mindset applies to staff too. Um, I know we teach us a lot to the kids that we work with, but uh, you have to be able to apply this to yourself, um, especially when it's like week after week of camps. It's really, you get kind of discouraged sometimes when things don't go well. So it's just, we're human, be forgiving, um, especially with the virtual, a lot of people were not comfortable with using Zoom, with being filmed, with with being on camera. I mean, for me, it was very, I felt very comfortable in this. I, I like tech. So it was really easy for me to learn all of this, but for my team, it, it wasn't. Um, so I had to do a lot of trainings and we had to practice and it feels silly to practice uh, amongst your peers, but I, I recommend it. And um, I was like, okay, show me, show me the lesson, do, do the activity for me. Um, so what I did was I turned my camera off and so they felt a little bit less intimidated and they just give me, allowing them to do that practice run is really great. 
Um, be open to new things, which means being open to failure. Some things just aren't going to work out. Some lessons just aren't going to work out. Um, when we do science, we always say, hey, you know, it's an experiment. It's not going to go well every single time. So let's learn from it and let's try again. Um, we did a paper mache activity that we made like a globe. And a lot of kids struggled with that if they don't have uh, adult guidance for things, you know, um, it, it was really hard. So for the siblings, we really encouraged them to share and help each other. And if they wanted their kinder uh, to come in, we made it very clear, okay, well, you know, these are the activities uh, that we've designed and they're designed for older kids. So you really have to um, step in to help them. And we put that responsibility on the caregivers because they're the ones choosing to participate. Um, so, you know, as, as much as we would love for everything to go well, we, we really kind of let them to have that. And then um, just, take everything a little bit less personally because <laughs> they get really upset when things don't work out. But um, also make space for reflection after each week, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what could we do better next time? How was my mood and how, how did I bring in the things that, um, you know, were affecting me because we were in a pandemic, there was a lot of stuff going on. Um, yeah, uh, the last thing is um, lesson six, let the kids chat. I took the chat away one day because they were talking about the dark web and it got a little weird. Um, and then the next day, the some of the kids didn't show up and I think I hurt their feelings. So I decided, okay, you know what? We're gonna do the chat and um, I understand that people communicate differently, um, but we're gonna have clear expectations. <laughs> so um, now you can easily disable it from the security feature. Um, back then you couldn't. And so we just made it very clear, you know, no private messaging with each other. You could take away that feature. Don't let them save the chat. And hey, the chat's for questions. If you want to um, not unmute yourself and share that way, it's open. And this is Binky here of our ball python. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a rundown of everything uh, that happened <laughs> in the nine weeks of camp. Um, we also had many other programs happening at that time. But this is my information. If you want to reach out, I'm happy to send samples of, of what we did. Wow, you did nine weeks. <laughs> Yeah, we, we did nine weeks and then we did one week back to school where we provided free lessons live every single day. Um, and yeah, it was it was a lot, but um, they wanted us to do like 12 weeks and I was like, no, <laughs> no. This so is still a lot. <laughs> yeah. What kind of feedback did you get um, like after the facts from parents or? Oh yeah. So they loved it. Um, actually, I'll, I'll share very quickly. Um, I took screenshots every week um, of the kids and then I made them a collage. So it was like, a, oh, that's my thing. Um, so I was like, hey, this is camp. Um, you know, this was from this week. And um, let's see. Um, ah, I can't, my things are being weird. Um, and then like this photo here, I'll share this really quick. They had their pets and they really wanted to share their pets with us. Um, so, so we let them do that. I don't know. It was just like all over the place, but the parents loved it. They loved the engagement part that, that we did of, of showing our collection and just really uh, having them do hands on activities instead of a bunch of like watch this video and learn from it. Um, and um, they also loved that um, like the, every week we kind of had the same campers. Eventually we got a got good traction with that. So they looked forward to seeing these kids every week. Like, oh, hey, it's Conrad, how are you doing? How's your cat? And so they got really engaged and, and that was an unexpected um, thing that happened was that they were so, they bonded really well. So we did like a little camp goodbye thing that final week. And um, yeah, I sent them like those collage pictures of like camp 2020 and, and everything. And one kid's put it at his desk as his desktop background, um, which was really cute. <laughs> so. so what are your plans for summer 21? Virtual, hybrid? Yeah, we're, we were gonna go hybrid, but we're, we're gonna do in person um, because we've had a lot of, um, of staff take teaching jobs. Um, so, you know, um, it, it, we had a, a couple of transitions. Um, we did get a PPP loan, which we just got news of um, two days ago. So I think that might change things. Um, but yeah, we, we plan to try to engage with our uh, local school district and help them with their childcare and offer camps in some kind of way. Um, and yeah, we're doing, we're doing small sessions, 16 kids in person spread out. Bring your own lunch. <laughs> so. Well, thanks guys. We also had one quick question. Um, what kind of uh, animals do you have 
to share? Oh yeah, um, we have we have bugs. Uh, we have Ryujin, who's a bearded dragon. We have a leopard gecko. We have a Gulf Coast toad. We have um, coral, who is pictured or a hermit crab. Um, we have fish, freshwater fish. We have a little shark guy. Um, we also had an aquaponics tank with a bunch of uh, minnows in it and things. Um, and we have Binky our ball python. Um, and we have a cockroach, uh, Madagascar hissing cockroaches. So just really great animals that can be handled and um, viewed on the screen. And the, the tip that we I gave everybody was just like, put them on your laptop and then just push your screen down and they can just chill here on the table or on your laptop. And it's just like shipping that view really helps instead of like trying to hold the animal up to here. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, I love hearing everybody. It's like just, just everybody is here is so good at like, you know, whatever problems come up, you know, taking it and running with it. So I'm always so impressed to find out what people are doing. So, okay, Erin, do you want to do start with the next one? I'm trying to pull it up right now, but if you have it, you can share my computer. Team. Okay. Yeah. Hang on one second. So the next one we have, they couldn't be here today. We've got um, Cindy Williams and Megan, and I'm not sure if I'm saying her last name correctly, from the Galveston Bay Foundation. So I'm also going to share, they have um, a Padlet that we can use to interact um, either before or after the video. So if you guys wanna open that up and then I will, I can share my screen and start this video. Just a second here. So all right. Hi, my name is Cindy Willems, and I'm the Director of Education for the Galveston Bay Foundation, an environmental nonprofit organization located in the Houston Galveston region of Texas. And my name is Megan Amy. And I'm the education coordinator and program manager of Galveston Bay Foundation's Get Hip to Habitat Student Wetland Restoration Program. Today, we will share how we've incorporated engineering principles into Get Hip to Habitat to make it a full STEM program in this presentation, Engineering Shorelines, Integrating Engineering into Environmental and Conservation Education. What you see here is a classroom full of students fully engaged in learning how engineering plays a part in restoring local marsh habitat. This activity directly correlates to Galveston Bay Foundation's mission and vision of the future. The mission of the Galveston Bay Foundation is to preserve and enhance Galveston Bay as a healthy and productive place for generations to come. We have five program areas, res education, restoration, water protection, conservation, and advocacy. Our youth education mission is to instill, inspire, and empower the next generation. Get Hip to Habitat is Galveston Bay Foundation's signature education program. Started in 2006, Get Hip to Habitat provides approximately 800 students in 6th to 12th grades around the greater Houston area with place-based watershed educational experiences each year. Participating schools are located all around the entire Galveston Bay Houston region. During this program, students harvest smooth core grass from our nursery ponds, create temporary wetlands on their school campus. Oops, sorry. Oh no, what happened? Let's go back. Create temporary wetlands on their school campuses, learn about the importance of wetlands, conduct water quality testing throughout the year to ensure plant health, and learn how to become environmental leaders in their community. The program includes a fall field trip to create their campus wetlands, two classroom workshops, additional lessons for teachers to implement throughout the year, and a final spring field trip to plant their cultivated plants at a marsh restoration site around Galveston Bay. During these marsh restoration events, students also participate in activities such as fish identification, birding, conducting plankton tows, and more. 
we've seen that this program produces students who are more aware of the world around them and have a higher connection with nature. They gain science and leadership skills while facing and overcoming many fears. Get Hip to Habitat creates meaningful change in students and in our local environment. Here's just one example of how quickly a restoration site can develop after Get Hip to Habitat students work their magic. Collaboration between engineers and scientists deliver better conservation outcomes. To grow and build the STEM aspect of Get Hip to Habitat, we decided to integrate an engineering component into our classroom workshop. Many students don't think of themselves as engineers, and most people don't realize how many engineering principles go into habitat restoration initiatives. To achieve this mission, we created a new classroom workshop that is given to each participating school called Engineering Shorelines. We say workshop because it is not a presentation. Instead of our educators standing in front of the class talking for an hour, the students themselves conduct this hands-on lab investigation using the equipment and materials we provide. During this workshop, students are put into the role of engineers and are given a specific location around Galveston Bay that is having issues with erosion control. Each location has its own set of issues, such as a broken bulkhead, failed erosion fencing, high winds and waves, and a specific budget. Students will read through a site description, like the one shown here, before starting their design. This example is of a potential site in Anahuac, on the east side of Galveston Bay. The students don't know this at first, but these sites are all previous marsh restoration sites that the Galveston Bay Foundation has completed over the past 20 years. Here is the real design of the Anahuac site. We share these pictures at the end of the workshop so students can compare what they designed with what was actually created. Materials include plastic bins, sand, plastic sheets, also known as wave makers, washable markers, models of marsh grass, bulkheads, and oyster reefs, a pitcher, and color pencils. Using the principles of engineering, students complete the following. First, they model storm action on the initial shoreline. Second, they develop an erosion prevention plan based on their site specific. And third, they build their erosion control method and test it to determine its success. Fourth, include simulating the effects of climate change over time. Educators add water to the models to indicate sea level rise and alter students' designs as needed. Some students learn that over time they've lost marsh grass if the wave action is too high and they don't have an additional protective barrier in their plan. After those alterations, students simulate another heavy storm, such as a hurricane, on their design to determine its coastal resiliency. At the end of the workshop, we discuss the various restoration sites and let them know what Galveston Bay Foundation did in real life to help prevent erosion at each location. During this investigation, they complete the workshop worksheet shown here, which allows teachers to use this lesson for a lab grade. Students use math, critical thinking, teamwork, prior knowledge, budgeting, science, and presentation skills during their experience. And by the end of the workshop, students have a better understanding of the benefits that living shorelines provide to the community and the long-term resiliency of the region. After adding the Engineering Shorelines workshop into the program, we have noticed that students have more of an understanding of why we are restoring marshes and how this process actually happens in real life. Additionally, we have received many positive comments from participating teachers. Since developing this, work this workshop, we've been able to expand our program offerings. First, we've adapted the workshop for 6th to 8th grade. We've created new lessons for teachers to do it on their own and share it during teacher professional development workshops. And we've used the Shoreline bin at science nights and community events. We've had a number of challenges with this project. One is making it relevant and as real life as possible. We had our habitat restoration staff help us with the site descriptions and details for the simulations, estimated costs, and more. 
Second, make it simple. We simplify the workshop enough to ensure students gain the main concepts and we're not overloaded with too many facts. Don't get stuck on all the fine details, concepts, and factors that go into engineering a shoreline in real life. Third, another challenge is the amount of materials needed for this activity. It is a pain to cart them around from school to school, but we know that teachers appreciate not having to have the materials themselves. And staff training, staff training can take time. This lesson is really time dependent, so staff need to have classroom and time management skills along with the knowledge behind the lesson. It is a complex workshop with many different scenarios that instructors have to learn before teaching it. Charts and instructor guides are a huge help. And as we said, this lesson isn't short. This would be best as a two-day lab, but most teachers can't have us come into the classroom for two days in a row. And some tips we have for you. Number one, go for it. Adding engineering doesn't need to be scary. Two, ask for help. Don't think you have to know everything. We learned so much from our habitat restoration team in designing this project. Three, be creative. Think of fun ways to bring engineering concepts to life. Make it hands-on, ask critical thinking questions. Four, know how it correlates to your state science standards. Five, practice and tweak as needed. We practiced this workshop with a majority of Galveston Bay Foundation staff to see if it would make sense to non-educators. And six, have fun. Students can tell when you aren't having fun. To wrap up, we hope this helps you think differently about how to incorporate engineering into your own environmental education programs. It has been a meaningful addition to our Get Hip to Habitat program. Please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions you might have. Thank you. So, so that looks like the link to the Padlet that I put into the chat. Yep, I saw, I checked out the Padlet and it looks like they just want um, feedback on your presentation or any questions that you have. Um, it was really great. I liked it. I always feel, I, I used to work at a, and so it was a really life science heavy site and I always felt that um I was like well I'm STEM because I'm science but I'm not like super like STEMy like what you think of from STEM um and that's a great example of how to, how to push yourselves into into those other concepts so I love it love it love it all right Anna who is our last one and I can share that one we have Morgan Kundi uh, sharing just a short video about some of her research. So you've got that one? Yeah. Okay. Hi, here. My name is Morgan Cunney. Oh, For the past two years, with the help of my research mentor, Dr. Amy Bryant, we've been researching the broad idea of outdoor education interventions and the effects, if any, that it has on training participants. In general, we know that spending time outdoors is beneficial to children emotionally, physically, cognitively, and socially. Yet, it's been demonstrated in the literature that children are not spending the recommended time outdoors. The effort to get more children outside can be seen by programs like Growing Up Wild by the Texas Parks and Wildlife Program, which aims to get more teachers comfortable implementing outdoor education for young children. This program has been around since 2008, but little research has really dived in to see what change, if any, teachers are experiencing. Our study aims to research this change by looking at teachers' attitudes, beliefs, and attentions before and after Growing Up Wild trainings. The beliefs that we carry about the world affects our attitudes. And those attitudes and beliefs work interchangeably and affects our intentions to do something. We had this research question in mind when we set out on this project. Does Growing Up Wild shift teachers' attitudes, beliefs, and intentions about outdoor learning experiences? To this end, we created new pre and post surveys that measure these beliefs, attitudes, and intentions across many variables known to implement outdoor education experiences. Uh, with the help of many of our community partners, especially Texas Parks and Wildlife, we were able to collect a data set of almost 194 participants from four states. 56 of the participants completed both a pre and a post survey. This paired data, we ran t-tests and regression analyses. Our results show some really cool findings. We found that teachers felt more confident implementing outdoor education with young children. They believed the outdoors can contributed to children's learning more after the training. They felt more comfortable with having children engage in messy, dirty play, taking risks outdoors. Weather was reported as less of a barrier. These results are amazing because it shows that short intervention like Growing Up Wild can have these changes on teachers. 
We hope that future studies can look at the longitudinal effects that these trainings can have. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, the sound, I think the video sound was a uh, was really soft, so hopefully we're able to. Uh, let's put the. Can you put that link in chat, Anna? Yes, I will do that. Yeah.